A warm hello and welcome to the Power of Our Story series, session number two, uh, brought to you by the New Krakow Friendship Society, uh, also known as NCFS. I'm Bonnie Cantor and have the privilege of serving on the board of this extraordinary organization started by Holocaust survivors. Tonight, we will examine the phenomenon of intergenerational trauma, trauma passed from parents to children. Our brilliant moderator will provide background on the meaning and effects, and together with our amazing panelists, uh, they will bring uh, their personal stories. Also a point to note that May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and Jewish American Heritage Month. And tonight we have representation from both groups. Let me introduce you to my fellow board member, Anna Schumann Gallegos and chair of the NCFS Social Action Committee. She will guide you through a polling question uh, before we get started, introduce our panelists and our speaker. Thank you again, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Bonnie. So everybody now should be able to see our attendees. There are three questions that ask how familiar with intergenerational trauma you are. Do you feel like you carry trauma from a previous generation? And if you have children, do you feel like this trauma has been passed on to them? So this is really just to give us a feel for who you are, who joined us today. After the panel, we're gonna be holding a Q&A. So please feel free to click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to add questions throughout. And if you enjoyed today's webinar, please consider making a donation to the new Krakow Friendship Society Welfare Fund. Uh, the Welfare Fund is what we use to help support survivors in need. Uh, and in addition, if you know of any Holocaust survivors that are in financial need, please reach out to us. At this point, I think, well, I'll leave the polling up for another second. Uh, so let me start by introducing our panel. So our moderator for today is L Elizabeth Rosner. She's the best-selling author of three novels, a poetry collection, and a book of nonfiction. Her award-winning work has been translated into nine languages. Her most recent, and the reason why we were so compelled to have her here today, is Survivor Cafe, The Legacy of Trauma and the Labyrinth of Memory. Next, we have Fong Nguyen, who is a consulting partner at Deloitte Consulting, focusing on state government. He has been at the firm for over 20 years and in that time has had many leadership positions. As an infant, Fong immigrated with his parents and two older brothers to the United States among the first wave of Vietnamese boat people. And he currently lives in Southern California with his wife and two children. Rachel Cerati is an award-winning photographer, writer, educator, and audio producer. Her critically acclaimed podcast, We Share the Same Sky, tells the story of her decade-long journey to retrace her grandmother's Holocaust survival story. Her memoir, also titled We Share the Same Sky, will be released this summer and is now available for pre-order. Rachel is currently the inaugural storyteller and in residence for the USC Shoah Foundation. Uh, as you see from our polling results should be up now, oh, that you can see that a good percentage, 45% are very familiar with intergenerational trauma with 39% a little familiar and 16% not familiar. So that's great. We have a lot to learn today. Um, and more than half feel like you carry trauma from a previous generation. And quite a few of you are not sure. So maybe this will help you explore that. And here, if you have children, do you feel like this trauma has been passed on to them? Definitely, yeah, 11% is a so definitely, 27% yes, but not as much as in my generation. But a good percent of, of you were not sure. So hopefully this will help you answer that question. So at this point, Elizabeth, take it away. 
Thank you so much, Anna and Bonnie, and welcome everyone. It's such a privilege to be with you this evening and to share with you my um, years of immersion in this very subject, both personally and professionally as a writer. And also, I feel it's really important to name, for starters, this moment that we're in where, um, strangely, almost all of us feel like the word trauma and the notion of trauma is surrounding us every day, all the time. And what we forget, what I think people maybe have a little bit of amnesia about already is that this is a relatively new self-awareness that for centuries, maybe even longer, when human beings go through difficult things, there isn't this name for it. And if you think back all the way to, let's say, for example, World War I and the notion of shell shock among soldiers in World War I, there was tremendous skepticism and doubt about whether that even was a real experience. And you fast forward to now where we use the word trauma almost casually to refer to events both large and small. And so I just want to begin by saying that, that we, that we are living through traumatic events collectively, globally, in fact, right now. And we still don't even know how much this language, this self-awareness is really helping us to process it in the long run. So the question that the poll asked and the reason that we're here to talk this evening to kind of unpack what does it mean to consider the idea that a traumatic experience in one generation has a ripple effect, both in some ways, literally, physiologically, and also emotionally, psychologically, and even metaphorically. So when I started writing my book, Survivor Cafe, back in 2015, when I was curious to start understanding what, what did people know, what did people understand already based on research, based on anecdotal evidence, what did people understand about how we were carrying the residue of things that didn't happen to us? So as a daughter of two Holocaust survivors, I grew up both hearing the stories of my parents and hearing the unspoken whispers of secrets or things that couldn't be spoken about. Why did that have such an effect on me in a way before I even had my own language, in a way before I even really knew all the details of what they had lived through? Well, among my generation, there was sort of this generalized understanding that, oh yeah, we were affected by things that happened before we were born, that's just a given. But it wasn't until very recently that this terminology started to arise, this research study started to be developed and immersed in by professional molecular biologists, psychotherapists, who were looking at the genetic residue of trauma. And I'm not saying the genes themselves were being modified, but switches, codes that genes were being expressed as, for example, what do people do when they experience stress? Their stress hormones get triggered. Well, it was starting to be discovered that Holocaust survivors, for example, had either highly, highly elevated levels of stress hormone or extremely low suppressed levels of stress hormones. And they started to notice that those same variations to the extreme were showing up in the children and now even the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. So this term epigenetic effect talks about something that is on top of the gene, something environmental has impacted the expression of the gene. So now we're starting to realize that this can be expanded to understand a lot of generational impacts of genocide, atrocity, slavery, war, refugees, exiles, people who were fleeing war-torn countries. 
And that's why we're here to do this, not just intergenerational, multi-generational conversation, but also this multicultural conversation. Because even though sometimes groups like my own descendants of Holocaust survivors think of ourselves as unique or exceptionally impacted by the epic scale of what happened during the Holocaust, more and more I'm coming to realize, and I think a lot of us are coming to realize, that this is something that we recognize in other groups as well, in other cultural histories, in other collective experiences of trauma. And so I want to say that this opportunity for us to talk together is a way of connecting the dots, using our storytelling, our language, our shared histories to reveal how this is truly a human story. It's not limited to any one group or culture or history, but is in fact part of what we do as human beings to carry our ancestral experiences forward. And it also raises what I think is a really rich opportunity to ask, how can we hold that history in a way that's meaningful, that builds our empathetic connections, and that enables us to see one another as fully dimensional human beings with complicated stories that we share. So what we're gonna be doing this evening is I'm gonna ask a few questions of both Rachel and Fong that I hope will stimulate some um, of their storytelling and sharing of their experience and their understanding of what it means to carry generational trauma and um, I'm also, by the way, going to emphasize that trauma also comes with resilience, and we're going to emphasize that aspect of this story as well. And then we're going to, um, after we share as, as the three of us as a panel, then we're going to invite, invite questions and comments from you. And my hope is that we will not necessarily answer every question, but that we might in fact raise even more questions by the end of the evening, which is kind of a very Jewish thing to do. You answer questions with more questions, but that really the, the possibility is for this, this discussion to be as wide and open as possible, because the truth is trauma, as we are experiencing it now, as we are coming more and more to understand how it affects us, is also something that changes over time and the conversation continues. So welcome again to all of you who are here with us. I wanna start by asking a question um, first of Rachel and then I'm gonna have Fong answer the same question. So um, the thing that, um, that we notice about people who have either lived through trauma as, as you directly did, Fong, as an infant, and Rachel as the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor whose story you deeply researched. The question I want to begin by asking is, um, what is your motivation for wanting to be here and share your story or wanting to do the work that you do out in the world, sharing your story with others? And, and if it's changed over time, can you talk about how that motivation has evolved for you? Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for being here and joining us. Uh, this is really, um, it's just really special to be able to have this conversation. Uh, so my answer to this question changes every single day. <laughs> it has 100% changed since I started digging into my family history. Uh, just a bit of background is I grew up with a very strong woman as the matriarch in my family, my grandmother. It was no secret that she was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, we knew that she was the only one alive in her family at the end of the war. We knew that she fled Czechoslovakia when she was 14 on her own. She was with a group of friends, but not with her family. And so really her childhood stopped very early and she was doing life on her own by the age of 14. Um, and that was all part of our inheritance and not in a way, I, at least in my memory, I don't remember it being a burden. I remember it being, I would say, nearly a point of pride of like, you know, look what, look what we called her Mati, look what Mati went through. It wasn't really until I got older that I started to understand 
how heavy that reality was. And I think that part of my continued motivation to not only continue digging into her story, because I've been now kind of, um, I'll use the word obsessed, <laughs> maybe, maybe on other days, I'll use the word immersed in her story for uh, over a dozen years now, is that, you know, it's, it's keeps changing what it, what it means to me. And on some days it's incredibly empowering to come from such a history because, you know, Elizabeth, as you said, you know, resilience, um, it, you know, and that, that's a very strong feeling. Um, and other days it adds sensitivity to what's happening in the world today. And it's just this constant question of what does this mean for me? And that's just one out of four immigrant grandparents. Um, and so the, it wasn't really until I started to dive into what it really meant to survive the Holocaust that I understood how burdensome it was. And so it's kind of interesting that I, I feel in some ways I opted into the trauma um, and it's increased the older I've gotten. I don't have children and I oftentimes wonder that if one day I do have children, if I will think about it even differently because I will be able to understand the perspective of her grand of her parents just a, just a tiny tiny little bit which I can't even touch now which is what does it mean to send your child away and so I think that as I've grown up with my grandmother's story I started digging into it when I was 20 years old and a very discontent college student who really just wanted to be a photojournalist uh, at the end of all this um, that you know as I've grown up into an adult that I've understood that heaviness on such deeper levels and I think part of digging into it, and then part of communicating it, telling the story, you know, in whatever media form I'm taking on that day um, has helped me understand it better. So it's like telling the story helps me understand it in some way. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that um, in many ways, you know, you are, well, not to embarrass you, you could be my daughter. <laughs> um, and this That's idea- wonderful, that, I love it. <laughs> that you and I are already kind of representing the, the generational differences and similarities. And so we're gonna talk more about that too. Um, Fong, if you would um, also answer this question for us, what motivates you? What has motivated you? to in some ways represent, you know, the history you come from. No, absolutely. Thank you everybody for showing up tonight um, and taking some time out of your evening just to listen. Cause I think that's step one of just building awareness around this topic in itself. Uh, for those who I haven't met, some of my Deloitte colleagues are on the line, but, and even they may not know my history. I was born in Vietnam um, and immigrated over as just a little baby with two older brothers uh, literally on a boat. So when you see those videos of the Vietnam War and, and folks escaping that, you know, maybe I'm in that picture somewhere with my family. Um, so very thankful for the folks who supported me and my family coming in here to the US along the way. But I'll answer the second part of your question first, Elizabeth, which has my motivation changed over time? And the answer is yes. Unfortunately, when I was just a kid growing up in the US, I didn't speak English until I was in first grade. And so the history that has made me who I am right now, at the very beginning, the motivation was a little bit of embarrassment, hiding the fact that I was an immigrant, um, trying just to fit in, having parents who didn't understand the American culture, who would ask questions like, why would you want to jump in the ocean with a board? Because that makes no sense to them at all. Um, a lot of culture clash. So at the beginning, my motivation was just, let me just get through this and I'll get to where I, I need to be. The second stage of my life was after graduating from college was, well, seeing how I grew up in a, a, in, in, in a poor situation, uh, both my parents were janitors along the way, gave me a different motivation, and it was success. But success in a very narrow definition in the sense of business success, titles, compensation, and losing some parts of my um, joy 
in chasing that single um, motivation at that part of my life. I was lucky enough to find a great firm and along the way had uh, met my wife as well as had uh, two kids, a eight-year-old boy now and a six-year-old girl. My motivation today, and it has been, is maybe seeing the little Fong who was embarrassed or, you know, the 20-year-old Fong that was so hyper-focused that it was a fault and saying, don't be embarrassed, I was there. Don't be hyper-focused because that's not complete success, holistic success. Sharing that story so other folks can connect with me where I'm at now in my professional career with my family success, sharing that story and actually changing that embarrassment into maybe being more proud of my mom and dad. You know, I, when I was growing up, I never would have shared that they were janitors. It was the last thing you would have heard come out of my mouth. And now I share it so that with the situation all around us, unfortunately with the increase of Asian hate, it's bringing some humanity, bringing folks like my parents um, into people's just normal conversation and, and making them just realize that what did they do? What was their motivation? And, and, you know, exposing that to more and more folks so that, you know, hopefully at least, even if it's just one or two or three or whatever we can affect, you know, lower that count of, of Asian hate around us and letting them just know that there's a human behind um, that, that count, that stereotype. Thank you so much, Fong. That's really, um, it's so poignant to hear you speak about that because um, of course the tragedy of racism that persists even now and even in many cases, a rising level of Asian hatred, anti-Semitism has been on the rise as well. And, you know, without going into a whole kind of political um, side trip, it, you know, it is part of this conversation for all of us clearly because um, the underlying causes of, of genocide and atrocity and, and in fact most wars have to do with exactly what you were talking about, dehumanization of, of this so-called other, right? So I love that, that what your story really entails is, um, is your own recognition that wanting to be seen in the fullness of your story and wanting your parents to be seen not only as who they are in America, but really who they might have been, could have been, you know, in their own lives had those lives not be dis been disrupted. And I think that often, and, and Rachel, I'm curious if you want to weigh in on this too, um, <clears throat> Often when people talk about Holocaust survivors and the Holocaust, there is a tendency to focus on, on the losses and the mass murder and the, the just eradication of entire towns, villages, cities, lives, families, lineages. But there's this, um, there's this forgetfulness sometimes about the life that people were leading you know, before all of that. And Fong, in your case, too, I mean, you know, your family didn't go into exile by choice, right? The choice was made for them. They had no uh, real alternative. And I think with so many refugees, even now, the same thing is happening again. So, Rachel, I'm curious if, if, if any of that resonates for you about... Um, the kind of the backstory also including a more um, complete reckoning with the, the wider human story. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that there's something um, very distinct that happens as the third generation and probably even more so as the fourth generation is I think that, and I, and I say this having a fair amount of conversations with my mother, but also knowing that I could have the same conversation with somebody and be completely, <laughs> have a very different conversation. But where when my curiosity got piqued about my family history, I mean, 
I knew that death and destruction was the cause of why we, why I'm alive now. And I'm very aware of that, but my curiosity was really like, who were these people? Who do I come from? And so I found myself much more fascinated by the life that was lived than the death that happened. And um, part of, you know, as I've grown into my career and have found myself working with survivor stories, I would say primarily of the Holocaust, but with other genocides as well. And I do a lot of work with, you know, the inheritance of memory, which includes the inheritance of trauma, um, is finding that there, there's this like deep desire to know who the people were. And while we have to understand how dark everything was around in the landscape in which, in which the Holocaust happened, um, within that there's like this desire to find the light, but you can't understand that it's like the light without understanding how dark it is. And I think that in many ways, that's how I framed understanding my grandmother's story is that her story is a light in the darkness, but that light means that she's the only survivor in her family starting at the age of 14. I mean, that's not, that's not a happy story. That's not a positive story, but in the context, you know, in the field of Holocaust studies, that is a more positive outcome. And that's only because I'm here to tell it. That's what ends up making it a story of light. Um, but I think that curiosity to want to touch the lives. And so that's why I think there's this like obsession with family photographs and what artifacts do you have and like what evidence that there was this family. Because for many people um, and for many uh, different threads of the family history, it's completely gone. So all you can do is wonder who people were. And that's where also the power of passing down the stories becomes such a cornerstone of our identity because all we have is what is spoken from one generation to the next. That's beautifully said. I think that when I was looking into my family history, you know, none of this is linear, right? I mean, we search, we find something, we go backwards, we find something different. And, and Fong, I'm gonna ask you about that too. This this digging, this, this learning, this realizing, this changing the way we feel about the history, and then sometimes wanting to like skip over the hard part, right? And, and I think Fong, what you were describing so beautifully too about just, you know, I'm going to make my life work and I'm going to do all the things I'm supposed to do to overcome the obstacles that my parents had to face. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to burn brightly in this life, you know, to make up for all of the sorrow and the loss. And I think that what we're also learning in, in the study of trauma and the study of resilience is that it's really, it's not as effective to skip over the understanding part. And, and you want to leap ahead to the triumphant, resilient, you know, success story. And so I think circling back to finding language, finding a way in to grieving sometimes those losses before you can move forward. And again, not because it's linear, but sometimes you have to keep revisiting those things. And so, you know, and all of our parents and grandparents have different levels of tolerance for that pain, right? And then, you know, Fong, you've got children now. So I'm curious about how you're, you know, communicating this story with them and and what does it mean to kind of allow this, the traumatic pieces, the displaced pieces to be part of that story without feeling overwhelmed by the sorrow? Elizabeth, I'll, I'll start with my number one concern of having the trauma and how it shaped me is I, I'm very, very blessed and fortunate. And my kids will never know what it means to eat fast with two older brothers. Because if you don't eat fast, you're not going to get your fair share. Or the excitement, because my parents are janitors, of when work had a pizza party and there was leftover pizza, that got brought home to the three Asian boys and how exciting that is. And so those who, my colleagues who know me, I'm 
an extreme optimist, Elizabeth, because of those things. And my fear, my concern is my kids get pizza all the time. Uh, <laughs> they're not, you know, knock on wood, they're not going hungry anytime soon. Um, so do they feel the joy and excitement and the appreciation that I carry with me because I, I had the pain, the, the trauma, the frustration on the other side. So my attitude is um, always the optimistic side. And, and I, I see that they're not. And I want to share that with them without having them carry the burden that we all share along the way and you know, like the embarrassment, some of the, the harsher feelings that we, we have of the trauma as well. Um, and so that's always in my head of how do I balance that? Because I'm positive my parents are very proud in, of me and they're the ones spoiling our grandkids now. But how do I ingrain some of the, the lessons that they taught me um, you know, I, I'm, I am in with some of my Deloitte colleagues because there are folks who say they care and then there are folks who show they care and it's very easy to see the difference. And even as a kid, I remember my parents never helped me with school. Um, they never sat down and we never did homework and at a certain point naturally just, you know, their, their education was Vietnam. They, they just let me go on my own. But I'll tell you the memory that I have, Elizabeth, that really shaped me was I missed the day of school um, because I was young and silly. Um, my dad worked the midnight shift because they had to work different shifts so that we, we only had one car in the family and you do that so you can balance the three kids. Someone has to watch the three, three boys. When I missed school, and I went and told my dad, who was sleeping, he woke up, put me on a 10-speed bike with a pillow, and, and I missed the bus, and rode me to school. So no matter what people tell you how important education is, when your dad, who's got a few hours of sleep, um, takes you to school on a bike, you know, I'm never going to give up on on education because of that. And I, I hope my kids, how, like, I, I guess for me, is how, how do I, I tell my kids it's important, but how do I show them it's important? Because I'm never going to ride my bike and take my, my son or kid to school. So uh, full disclosure, I'm, I'm too lazy to do that now. But um, so I, I'm trying to figure out how to keep parts of the, the burden, the parts of the memory, parts of of you know the hardship that we face so that they actually enjoy life a little bit more as well. It's such a paradox that you're describing. And I think it's really recognizable to me and probably to Rachel as well, this question of how do you transmit the lessons of adversity without you know, making someone suffer through the actual adversity. And I think what's so interesting is just that story itself becomes the teaching, right? Mm -hmm. That, you know, and, and I'm, I'm guessing that you've told your kids that story and that, that they know that they can picture you and your dad on that bicycle together, you know? And, and I think that's why we're here in, in the theme of the power of stories, right? That stories teach mm -hmm. us things both in our awareness and also somewhere below the surface of our awareness, even those, these messages get transmitted. I'd love to make a comment on that too, because this is where I think the difference of me being a third generation comes into play because I'm that generation and people like are worried if we're gonna care and you know what that's gonna look like. And I work a lot in education and I um, found like what, what a lot of parents say to me is exactly what you're expressing, you know, and they see me as being somebody who really cares about my family history, which I do. Um, and so <laughs> a lot of parents come to me and, you know, like, how do I get my kid to care? How do I get my kid to care? Which is a very 
emotional, valid, very important question to be thinking about. Um, and I, I often respond with like, well, I didn't really care for a while. At least I don't think I did. You know, I like looking back, I can like pinpoint certain moments along, you know, my childhood and my teenagehood where I was like, oh, clearly I did care, but I wasn't totally aware of it. Um, but I remember like in high school, my mom was oh my gosh, she was like so upset because like on the Jewish holidays, I would like go work, you know, like go to my job. And that was more important to me. Um, and now <laughs> I work, you know, my, my entire existence in many ways is surrounded around my family history and my cultural heritage. Um, and it took a while to get there. And I think that there's this thing where like, you want to instill the questions, the curiosities, and like, it's like dropping the breadcrumbs along the way. So when it mm. comes time where the relevance jumps in, like, I do believe that people come to this, like the caring for it, it looks differently for everybody. It impacts them differently. And it also comes at different stages of a life. So sometimes it's after somebody they love dies or somebody they love is born. Um, and where, but if enough breadcrumbs have been dropped along the way, they can collect that and, and have a full story to work off of, or at least a piece of a story to work off of. Definitely true. And I can speak again, you know, from my perspective in my family, I, I'm one of three kids. We each responded very, very differently to our inheritance, right? And, and my sister and brother both had children and they're choosing in many ways to pass on the legacies that they learned through their children. I don't have children, I write books and, and my books are very much my way of continuing the storytelling. And I, this is sort of half joking, half serious, but recently I was talking to my father about, it's very common among Holocaust survivors to kind of count their blessings according to how many grandchildren they have. Hmm how many great grandchildren they have. It's sort of, that's very classic, um, you know, kind of Hitler didn't win, look at me and look at how many, you know, people I've produced. And certainly there was a lot of pressure on all of us to have children and I somehow resisted that pressure. But I was talking about that with my father and he said, oh, your books are much better than children. Because <laughs> <laughs> because your books are your books are making me live forever you know and and that really really touched my heart because sometimes we think there really is only one way to validate our, what our parents went through to validate what our grandparents went through and so Fong when you say in your story that's on the Deloitte um, page about um, your backstory. It's this amazingly brief like paragraph that references, you know, the incredible, dramatic, terrifying experience of your family fleeing Vietnam. And there's that line, you know, my mother, um, you were an infant, right? Your mother was breastfeeding you. My mother, I think you said my mother fed me with everything she had. Right. I mean, that sentence just tells volumes, you know, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. And she was feeding you with her own body. It, Elizabeth, it, it's, it's what made me who I am today, just knowing my parents and, and that journey that you, you referenced. Um, but at full disclosure, I've had to actually check my own personality and my own um, demanding uh, ways on the people around me. It, meaning with my kids, with my coworkers, with, you know, my bosses. Um, what I mean by that, Elizabeth, is I, I, will, I, I will work 24 by seven because unfortunately I remember those statements and I lived through what my parents, um, um, one, what they shared with me, because some of this is not in my memory. Some of this, just to tie it back, is stories that they pass on. Some of it is memory. Some of it is probably my brother's making up stories just to tease me as well. But because of all these stories, I found out that I was not empathetic to folks who, um, 
they don't work 24 by seven. Or, you know, I've had fights with my wife where unfortunately she would complain about something. Normal human nature. Absolutely like things that I complain about now, but along the way, the stories were, the trauma, the, it was too much where I'd be like, why would you be complaining? Because it would be always a reference point of you weren't on a boat like my parents, like you weren't starving and being a baby. How could you complain nowadays? I have had to very consciously check that thinking because I was becoming a jerk about it, Elizabeth. Um, Cause I couldn't just let people complain. I just couldn't understand why they couldn't work the extra hours. Couldn't understand how, you know, um, they would throw away good food. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't eat everything on your plate, by the way, because I had to give up that habit too, because, you know, we're very fortunate. But I think that some of those things, um, the, the trauma, the stories, the things could lead to a bad spot if, if you're not too self-aware of it. And luckily I had some found a good wife and some good friends who told me that I was being a jerk and uh, unfair about the comparison. So I, I, I try to, I do try to balance the reference points nowadays not, and not going all the way back to, you know, the night the late 1970s too, as that being the, 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 you know, the bar you could say. I totally relate to that. Like, but I, I, I relate to it differently where it's a lot of it's like internal, like, how could I be upset about that? Like, how could I be hurt? How could I be, you know, am I even allowed to feel pain? Um, and from the small things to the big things in my life where, you know, and I think it's, it's not only my grandmother's story that I'm now immersed in every day, but I'm, I, all I do is I sit with survivor stories and witness stories where it's just every single day I'm being exposed to a new story that is as horrific as it is unique, as it is um, empowering in some ways because of what these people went through and the fact that they're choosing to sit down and share their story, you know, so it can be passed the next generation. And I think it, it really does something to you. And it's, it is, it's really, really hard when something really small happens that feels really big and you have to fight this internal voice that's saying well you're not allowed to feel that way like just you know look how good your life is um, and my grandmother had a saying that helps me kind of crawl out of this which and it can be a very damaging feeling but my grandmother would say that your feet still hurt even if the person next to you doesn't have feet and mm. i have to think about that a lot and remind myself that like you know you're a teenage girl and you're, you know, you, you have your first breakup. That is like extreme pain in so many ways. And, you know, and, and I, I see it, I've seen it in survivor families. And I've talked to my friends about this who have survivor grandparents as well, or, or parents where it's like, sometimes it's like, oh, you don't know pain. And then sometimes this is like over empathy in many ways. Um, but I think this like emotional balance is really, really hard. It's really hard to find. I'm so glad you cited that saying of your grandmother's that's so perfect and um, and really encapsulates the paradox of, of this state we're talking about, which is this, this kind of measuring of our experience against the experience of others. And, and what I love about what both of you are doing, Rachel and Fong, is you know, you're describing the conscious wrestling with sometimes unconscious stuff. And that um, you know, if our parents, our grandparents could have chosen not to give us this trauma, they would absolutely have chosen it. And Nobody believes that um, you know we're we're we need to go through hard things because it's good for us. I mean, we we do sort of believe that. I think that's like the old kind of military father model, right? I'm gonna treat my kids like they're in boot camp, but but yet below the surface there is this tendency to ask myself: Is my suffering you know worth even? looking at because it doesn't compare to 
the enormity of what happened to others. And so Fung, I think what's so courageous in what you were describing is um, that you took a hard look at it, right? And you asked yourself, is this really how I want to be? Do I want to use that standard over and over again? Because the alternative is empathy, right? The alternative is to have this spaciousness that can allow for all the other feelings to be present, even if, you know, what Rachel just said, if I'm going to remember it accurately, I feel like I wanted to write it down, you know, your feet can still hurt, even if the person next to you has no feet. It, you know, it isn't about competitive victimization, even though there is this tendency to want to arrange things hierarchically in the world. And so I think that what we're doing here tonight is also helping look at this spectrum of suffering. I think right in this very moment, maybe some people who are with us right now are already reflecting on, you know, where do I measure up in that, in that hierarchy of pain? Or what have I been through that could compare? And I think it's not about comparing, it's about recognizing that there is an incredible range of ways to suffer in this life. And what do we do to mitigate the suffering of others? What do we do to help prevent the suffering of others? And that's where, you know, the way we begin to build resilience is also we, re we build empathetic, compassionate spaciousness toward others. And stories do that. I mean, that's one of the beauties of the study of storytelling, it shows that you can actually increase people's empathy by way of listening to stories. And so that's what both of you are allowing people to do today. And we are already getting some, some questions about, um, about the, the trauma of what we carry with us and how we address current trauma. So not only what do we do with the trauma that happened historically or the trauma that happened to our ancestors, but what happens when we get re-traumatized right now, for example, with the anti-Asian hatred, the anti-Semitic hatred, you know, so Fong and Rachel, maybe you can talk about how you apply your experience and your learning to what's happening now. It's, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, and I do think a lot about my parents because, you know, um, I, I, you, we see the videos out there um, of the random acts of violence and it's, it sticks in your head. Um, you probably won't find much about me besides a LinkedIn profile, Elizabeth and Rachel. And this, this, this wave of, of hatred around us actually encouraged me to come on this panel with you guys, because I am, I, 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 I think I could count on one hand how many times I've posted on social media. I think I'm um, not out there uh, in the public space as much, but I think the story of my parents and then the story of me and then the story of my kids. And I'm hoping that it reaches someone who doesn't know an Asian person or who hasn't heard the personal story and just nudges them to say hello or who sees the name, you know, Fong Win and <laughs> assumes, you know, um, heavy accent, which I did at, when I was younger, um, and, and just says hello. And, and maybe, you know, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm very pragmatic and, and realist in the sense that can't change the world, but I am more open now because of these stories that I'm trying to reach to others so they can just get a glimpse. If they don't have a friend, who is an immigrant or that they don't have a friend who has an, you know, the Asian culture, um, that they just hear the story and it may just add some humanity to what they possibly might be thinking about doing. And 
And so, yeah, I think the recent unfortunate event has, has encouraged me to use my platform, to use my voice, to tell my parents' story, because there is no way my parents would be telling the story on their own. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that second generation, the first generation, the third generation, and, 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 and that we continue telling these stories because it, it, it'll, we're, we're sharing it on their behalf um, and just making people aware. Thank you so much for that answer. I, I think, you know, when I began talking about how we forget that trauma wasn't an everyday word, you know, some years ago, people also probably don't realize that Holocaust survivors at first didn't speak very much about their experiences either. And that it took a while for um, Japanese survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to speak about their experiences. And this is not uncommon for the, for the immediate experience of trauma survivors to be sort of put away somewhere, shelved, to get on with life. And then, as you say, for the subsequent generations to start asking questions or to start speaking in the name of, on behalf of their, their parents and grandparents. So um, Rachel, I wonder if you wanna comment on that too about um, how your understanding of, of history helps shape the way you respond to the racism um, and the events that are unfortunately on the rise now. Yeah. Um, well, for so Fong, thank you for sharing because, you know, I have to say, like, I consider myself, you know, I like to read and I like to consume stories and I'm curious about people who come from different backgrounds that I do. But um, I think that oftentimes in the wake of whatever xenophobic or prejudice um, is, is, you know, kind of front and center in our world, it does encourage many of us to seek out stories. And I think that in the past, you know, many months I've realized like, oh, I really am not as aware of the Asian American experience as I'd like to be. And, you know, this personal narrative, sto personal storytelling is like the way that my mind can wrap around it, right? Like I can read about policies and I can read about history, but it's really the personal narratives that help me make sense of history. And I think that's partly why I've become so entranced with my grandmother's story because all of her anecdotes along the way help me make sense of this really large period of history that is so like inconceivable and unfathomable in many ways that like that's the only way to make sense of it is by personal experiences and then kind of stitching them together to get a sense of it. Um, I'll say that the more aware I become of, and I'll speak to anti-Semitism for a moment, but like particularly I would say, I'll say like since the Pittsburgh shooting, particularly I'm gonna start there, realizing just how scared I am of being Jewish, which is not something I really remember feeling when I was younger. Um, and once again, that might be because I spend so much time learning about historical, you know, tr where anti-Semitism comes from over the past, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years where I can pick up on, on small subtleties in a way that I might not pick up on them if I wasn't, um, if I hadn't schooled myself in the roots of all of this. Um, and I think it's it's both an important side effect and an unfortunate side effect that so much fear comes along with being so aware of one's history. Um, and it's really hard, I, you know, and also partner up the fact that I do a lot of public speaking and suddenly, you know, I find myself, you know, uh, in front of an audience talking about Jewish identity and Jewish history. And, you know, and, and your mind wonders, <laughs> wanders. And I, and I think that, you know, uh, you know, Jewish storytelling, we tell stories and which means we tell stories to ourselves also and our imaginations can get away, away from us a bit, at least mine can. Um, so I think that that's one of the things that comes from knowing it is that then you have to balance the fear of knowing that you come from a history where people wanted you dead. Like they didn't want you alive. And I think that you can, sometimes it's like very easy for me to get lost in the resilience. And I think it's a really, really, really important piece of it. And I would say the majority of what I think about is just how strong the generations before me have been and what they've taught me about getting through really difficult situations. And as I've gone through certain traumas in my own life and, and really hard losses, I've leaned very heavily 
on the stories of the generations of those who came before me to help me push through it. Um, but it, but it's also, you know, along with that, <laughs> the emotional complexities of life and all the contradictions is that it, it's also, it's also painful and scary to know where you come from. You know, I just came across a study recently. Um, I didn't see the study. I heard about the study that says, you know, descendants of Holocaust survivors, both second generation and third generation, are more than twice as likely to go into helping professions. And so one of the ways that we are, like I would say, making use of this history is, is to see how we can be of service in the world and that, um, you know, some of us do it creatively, some of us do it as psychotherapists or physicians or um, teachers. And I think this idea, as Fong mentioned, that, um, that we are representing, you know, the human story and not being reduced to stereotypes or false assumptions about, you know, the association with poor immigrant or that you you find your you know i am constantly trying to encourage people to let go of the word immigrant even most of the time and and use the word refugee because so many people who come to america are coming here as refugees not by choice as you described in your own family background fong and that um that this is out of desperation. This is, you know, able to bring nothing of the life that you had with you except your own tenacious survival skills <laughs> and your will to give your children whatever they need. And then that gets transmitted again generationally into, you know, we're going to be fiercely successful and we're going to thrive. And then people forget that that success was built up from a survival story, you know? So and I think that the stories help change perception, per, per, perspective as well. Um, if you saw my parents and you spoke to them, you know, and as a kid, I always heard, um, you know, you hear the noise behind you or at school and stuff, but, you know, I was always fearful that folks thought my parents were stupid mm. because they have a heavy accent, Elizabeth. And um, my dad speaks broken English. My mom speaks even less. And I think the refugee concept helped or telling the story because I, I heard a, a line on a podcast that says, you know, what you should think about when you hear someone with an accent is not that they're stupid, is how brave and courageous they are because they chose to speak your language and, and they're, they're, they're trying their hardest to get through it. And they obviously can speak another language, right? And so it's like, maybe they're multilingual. You know, and my dad could, I think, speaks four or five languages, but breaking some of the perception around us, around, oh, you know, they have an accent, whatever accent, that comes from the stigma and the stereotype, if we can go and change some of those perceptions of, of it, I think these stories will help. Of, yeah, you might hear the Asian accent or the Vietnamese accent, but you know, if you, if you know the backstory, you won't have the, the perception that they're stupid, but mm -hmm. rather you'd be thinking how brave and courageous or how smart they are because they know multiple language and they're trying to learn English <laughs> late in life, nonetheless. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think what we're really also saying, you know, not to put words in your mouth, but sort of, you know, rephrase it in my own way is that um, this willingness to kind of not assume you know everything about this person standing in front of you um, and to be curious. And, and, and I think that one of the things that you know, is getting emphasized here in all of our conversation and in things that Rachel's saying as well, are that um, sometimes we have to evolve into that curiosity. You know, mm. it doesn't necessarily come naturally. And so sometimes we have to be encouraged to ask questions 
And one of the questions in the in the Q and A that I'm really struck by is um, about what is how do you get curious about what you've inherited if what you've inherited is a perpetrator side of the story? You know what what kind of digging can you do if there's shame and secrecy and you can't again just leap over into I'm going to focus on the positive and I'm going to be I, I'm going to be the kind of person that I want to be. Some people are descended from slave owners. Some people in the United States are descended from people who were perpetrators. Some people in Europe are descended from members of the Nazi party. What do we do to look at that? inherited trauma and have compassion for that level of suffering too. It's really complicated again, but I think it also humaniz humanizes someone born into a family with that level of violence, darkness, um, and and that level of loss. And so I'm I'm curious if either Rachel or Fong want to comment on that because it's it's an important question. It gets asked a lot when we talk about intergenerational transmission. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that one. Um, I, I I think it's such an important question, and I want to I want to uh, bring up the work of a friend of mine named Julie Lindahl who lives in Sweden, and she is the granddaughter of an SS officer. And Julie and I met, oh, a number of years ago now. And, and um, actually WBUR, which is NPR, uh, Boston's NPR station did this whole lovely um, three-part series about our stories that you can find online. It's called Beyond Sides of History, where we talk exactly about this, where Julie and I met and we realized that, you know, I felt a little crazy for a bunch of years because I was doing this like deep, dive into my grandmother's history where like I went into nomadic journalist zone and <laughs> lived nowhere for a whole bunch of years and like really really just kind of like derailed um <laughs> any normal uh 20 year old's life and, and went out went out to follow my grandmother's history and then I met Julie who had done something very similar with her own history and she had a very different past where she was the granddaughter of an SS officer, but didn't know until much later on in life. She, she's in her 50s. She's a little bit older than me. And we found that both of our motivations and well, our motivations were a bit different, but both of our uh, motivations for telling the story um, were, were quite similar, even though we came from different paths, which is like, you know, how do we heal a broken present with the stories of the past? And that's really where we found a lot of similarities um, in how we were thinking and why we were doing the research that we were doing and what you know all this stuff. Um, she's a she's a book that's wonderful. It's called The Pendulum and it digs into a lot of this. So for anyone who is interested in um, in exploring that topic more, I, I highly recommend it. And I'll I'll put her name into the chat. Julie and I um, have gotten to know each other too. And she is, you know, she's very courageously looking at hard, hard history, personal history. Fong, was there something you wanted to say about that? I think there are definitely secrets and lies and, and hidden um, facts, even in my history, I would say, um, that are not shared. Um, the, the example is my dad has, um, a tattoo on his arm that I don't know what it's about, but it, it, he scraped it off. Uh, it wasn't like a, you know, high tech surgery laser removal. It was, Hey, um, this tattoo is not coming with him, um, with the kids in the U S here, um, and I, I doubt I'm ever going to find out about it unless, you know, a relative tells me otherwise. But there, the, I think the part of the, the, the bad stuff is maybe for us is just knowing the context, seeking the context, seeking, you know, and maybe not judging the person in it in, in isolation, but saying in that context, this occurred. It's absolutely wrong. It's absolutely, you know, un unfathomable. 
but just having understanding, having context, having the curiosity to, to use your words, Elizabeth, um, may, may help us all kind of just start with um, putting ourselves in their shoes and, and not judging right off the bat, even with the, the secrets and lies, because I'm sure it's all around us. And sometimes it's just not passed along in that sense. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right that um, that taking in a bigger a bigger surround for that for that story is so essential. And I think really um, Julie Lindahl and 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 I'm sure a few others like her can exemplify that willingness not even to cast judgment on her own ancestors until she learned as much as she possibly could learn. And, and that we almost all of us at some point or another bump up against a secret or a silence or a place where there's almost no way to know the full story. And, um, and to in some ways have compassion for the not knowing and, and to be able to hold that uncertainty and that discomfort. Um, the opposite of, of that would be a, another question we're being asked about um, our ability to experience joy, you know, when we, when we carry the stories of the past that include so much suffering and so much loss. Is there a way that, um, Again, I think there are probably a lot of studies that can speak to this. Um, do we have trouble? I, I, there's a shorthand that people use all the time that I'm not crazy about, but it speaks to this survivor guilt. You know, is there some way in which we mitigate our own our own happiness because it feels like a betrayal to those who have suffered? Fong or Rachel or both of you. Uh, sure, I can jump in. Um, well, I think it's interesting because I, I think if there's like <laughs> anything I took from from my grandmother's story, it's that like the emotional complexities are so real and the emotional contradictions are even realer <laughs> where it is crazy how we can feel such contradictory things at one time and they're and they're also authentic like completely and totally authentic where you know it's like you can hold the fear and you can hold the deep grief um, and you can hold the anger and that can also partner with feeling immense joy and gratitude and admiration um, and you can be angry and forgive at the same time like I think that sometimes um, you know we're raised in this space where we want to kind of box in our emotions and isolate them. And that's just like not the human condition at all. And I think that, you know, as I've experienced grief in my own life and been able to pay deeper attention to the grief in not only my grandmother's stories, but other survivor stories where you can also then pick out the joy differently. Because when I think that, you know, uh, Fong, in the beginning, you said you're very optimistic and you're very, which is, which is, you know, I strive to be that way and deeply appreciative of everything I have. And my grandmother was like the most alive, joyful, full of energy human. I know like she was just like, she just always said that she won the lottery of life. And like to understand how a Holocaust survivor could say that was like, it still doesn't totally comprehend for me. Um, but I, I think it's so beautiful. And I think survivor stories and, and, the stories that the descendants hold like really help us teach us about the human condition. Like this is what it means is that we just hold all of this and some days, some of it comes out more than others. Thank you, Fong. I know you you spoke about it before a little bit when you talked about pizza, the joy of the joy. Of <laughs> I, I think it's, it's for me now where I'm at, you know, I, I it is just controlling and, and kind of understanding that the spectrum of the, the survivor's guilt, um, that the silly example of it is now okay for me not to finish my, all the food on my plate. That was the hardest thing to get over um, along the way to enjoying pizza. So I think it's, it's uh, I, I love what Rachel said is, you know, feeling it all at once, 
feeling the full spectrum of it. I think for me, the survivor's guilt kind of takes, kind of amplifies both sides, amplifies the joy, but also amplifies the, the grief or the guilt of anything I do um, along the way. I mean, I lean towards being a, um, a hoarder, I think because of the, some of the survivor's guilt of like, you didn't throw stuff away. And, and so I think just understanding how it's amplified on both ways and then just being aware of it, bring it back to, hey, you can feel both, but just don't take it to the extreme either way. Because I think the extreme feelings could, could, um, could be bad in c- certain situations. The, I so appreciate that answer and, and really from both of you that that coming together of, of a full acceptance of the human experience is, is also a, a beautiful note for us to end on here because really the inclusion of these stories and of the complexity of our experiences, the complexity of what we carry individually as well as as in our families, in our tribe, in our collective, in our culture, um, is a way of saying there isn't there isn't room for us to be choosing one or the other to humanize. There isn't room. We don't have time to you know compete over who deserves our empathy or who deserves our curiosity and our compassion, and to allow for there to be room for all of these stories to be told means that we are recognizing each other in our, in our full human experience. And I'm, I'm so grateful to the New Krakow Friendship Society for giving us the chance to talk this way um, in such deeply personal and also really um, hopefully multicultural and intergenerational language so that so that people from all backgrounds can can relate to what we're saying. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, Fong, Rachel. I really feel like this is just the beginning for many of us of an exploration into intergenerational trauma. And I really just appreciate your openness and willing to talk about such deeply personal things. So on behalf of myself and Bonnie and the rest of the New Crack Air Friendship Society, thank you so much. And a big thank you to all of you who joined us today. A recording of this discussion will be available on our YouTube page for viewing by tomorrow. And a follow-up email is going to be sent with the link if you want to share. Uh, Included in that email will be links to Elizabeth and Rachel's websites. You can see the work that they're doing in this vein. Um, And once again, please consider making a donation to the New Cracker Friendship Society Welfare Fund. There's the donate button right on our homepage that we may continue to support Holocaust survivors that are in need. Thank you, thank you again so much. Good night.